thought I had no uh, knowledge of monarchy at all until I began to re write the paper. And then, of course, I remembered that kings and queens, princes and princesses, belong above all to the proper disposal of things in the world of fairy tales, the universal once upon a time of the imagination of humankind from time immemorial. Whether in Ireland's rain, Russia's snows, Norway's long winter nights, or India's monsoon, the stories are told and have raised their, imaginative pal their imagined palaces and established their enduring kingdoms of which all the world's childhood are citizens and of which we have all been inhabitants. Are these kings and queens memories of history become legendary, as you humorists would have us believe? Or does history forever seek to realize dream? There are passages in Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire describing the city of Byzantium, which might come from some fairy tale. Gibbon thus describes the imperial splendor. The square before the sigma, a semicircular portico, was decorated by a fountain, and the margin of the basin was lined and encompassed with plates of silver. In the beginning of each season, this basin, instead of water, was replenished with the most exquisite fruits, which were abandoned to the populace for the entertainment of the prince. He enjoyed this tumultuous spectacle from a throne, resplendent with gold and gems, which was raised by a marble staircase to the height of a lofty terrace. Below the throne were seated the officers of the guards, the magistrates, the chiefs of the factions of the circus. The inferior steps were occupied by the people, and the place below was covered with troops of dancers, singers, and pantomimes. We have to remember that Constantine the Great built Byzantium in the likeness of the city of Jerusalem as imagined in the Book of Revelation, and Justinian restored Santa Sophia in emulation of the Temple of Jerusalem. Did not the city itself embody that age-old dream? Gibbon himself scorned the fantasy of a golden tree with leaves and branches that sheltered a multitude of birds that warbled their artificial notes, and two lions of massy gold, and of the natural size were looked towards their who looked and roared like their brothers in the forest. The golden tree has made its way back into poetry in Yeats's poem Sailing to Byzantium. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Commenting on Lady Gregory's gods and fighting men, Yeats brings that country of the imagination full circle when he writes, The poor fisher has no possessions of the world and so no responsibility for it. And if he dreams of a love gift better than the brown shawl that seems too common for poetry, why should he not dream of a glove made of the skin of a bird or shoes made from the skin of a fish or a coat made from the glittering garment of the salmon? Was it not Aeschylus who said he but served up dishes from the banquet of Homer? But Homer himself found the great banquet on an earthen floor and under a broken roof. In the same foreword he writes, I have read in a fabulous book that Adam had but to imagine a bird and it was born into life and that he created all things out of himself by nothing more important than an unflagging fancy. How else are those cities built according to a model laid up in heaven according to the city of imagination? In that kingdom of once upon a time, kings have unlimited power and splendor, secure kingdoms and loyal subjects, 
Princes are handsome and courteous to all, to the poor and the old no less than to personages of the highest rank. Princesses are beautiful and set a high price on themselves, some hard task to be performed as a condition of marriage, and their hand may be won by the third son of a poor woodcutter or the owner of Puss in Boots as easily as by Lohengrin from a mysterious high world. In the world of imagination, there are no presidents or prime ministers, and do we not in the Lord's Prayer a tribute to God the kingdom, the power, and the glory. As for King George, the real king, his neat profile was familiar because it appeared on our postage stamps, red penny stamps for letters, green halfpenny stamps for postcards, and as part of the natural order of things, like the weather. King George and Queen Mary lived by no means in the Mundus Imaginalis, but at least in a world apart from most of us, in a palace and invisible except on special occasions, the opening of buildings, inspecting troops, launching liars, liar, liners that brought them into public view. King George visited our obscure East London suburb on the occasion of his opening the hospital, named after him, and we school children lined the streets of Ilford to be rewarded by a glimpse of the king and queen as they drove past on in an open car. The occasion was of importance mainly to grown-ups involved in the important event in one way or another. Even so, there was a general feeling that a little gold dust had been scattered from that passing car. Some magical power still belonged, it seemed, to real kings and queens or to princes, as the popular song, I know a girl who knows a girl who danced with the Prince of Wales a popular figure at that time. Monarchy has, with Shakespeare, remained within the realm of poetry. Shakespeare was by profession employed with his company of players by Queen Elizabeth I and was therefore bound to support the Tudor monarchy. A whole paper, many papers, could be devoted to Shakespeare's historical plays, which are, in a sense, the foundation of the English concept of kingship. But it is not only in these that the theme of monarchy predominates. In Macbeth, Hamlet, King Lear, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and As You Like It, kingship and its legitimacy are dominant themes. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, the magnanimous con conduct of Duke Theseus towards the rude mechanicals who offered their play for his entertainment is contrasted with the uh, contempt of Philostrate, the master of rebels, and with Hippolyta, the bride-to-be frank, frank Borden. In As You Like It, the banished king sees, uh, sets up his court in the forest of Arden. His kingship is in harmony with the order of nature, where there are sermons in stones, books in the running books, and good in everything. In King Lear, <coughs> uh, banished and dis in, in, in disguise, names a polity of the king though stripped of his rank that entitles Kent, banished and in disguise, names the quality of the king, though stripped of his rank, that entitles him to his service. How now? What art thou? A man, sir? What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? I do profess no less than I seem to serve him truly that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, in fight, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. What art thou, a very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king? If thou be as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. 
What wouldst thou? Service? Whom wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir. But you have that in your countenance that I would fain call master. What is that? Authority. Later in the play, Lear himself justifies respect for the invisible honour of rank, of the, or as at the moment when he himself has been stripped of his following of a hundred knights. O oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm, but for true need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. In contrast with the authority Kent sees in Lear, though stripped of his power, Macbeth's usurped authority brings him neither happiness where, nor honour, whereas Banquo, less happy than Macbeth, yet happier, will be honoured as fathering a line of kings. For Shakespeare, kingship represented the fitting order of things to which it was for actual kings to, to conform. After the reign of Elizabeth I, in fact, imagination in history tended to diverge, and history tended to diverge. Mary, Queen of Scots, captured the imagination but lost her kingdom. In the Civil War, a generation later, Cromwell was victorious, and King Charles claim, I's claim to the divine right of kings rejected by the nation. Arguably, the king overstepped the bounds of natural justice, but Cromwell's victory was short-lived, and he had no successor to the office of Lord Protector. He proved to be a tyrant whose reign is remembered in Ireland as the curse of Cromwell. The nation felt happier with the king, and with the restoration of Charles II, the absolute power of the king's divine right was curbed by Parliament in a constitutional monarchy, which has lasted ever since. Poetry again returned with, the power, with power in the attempt to, retore, to restore the Stuart monarchy by the young pretender Charles Edward Stuart. The political battle was lost, but the songs of the forty-five testify to this day to the victory of Bonnie Prince Charlie of the Scottish Royalists as the uncrowned King of Scotland. Follow thee, follow thee, wha wadna follow thee, King o'er hill and hearts, Bonnie Prince Charlie. In fact, Prince Charles Edward fell short of the image poetry has created of him, but remains as the legend, as the king of the water, who holds Scotland's loyalty almost to this day with Wallace and Bruce in the songs that live on. However, the Scottish tongue has a gift of scorn and denigration no less than its eloquence for patriotism, but less appreciated on the English side of the border, where the Hanoverian monarchy was greeted with songs of a different kind. What the deal have we gotten for a king but a wee wee German lerdy? In the course of the 20th century, the world as we know it has been transformed by technology. At the end of the First World War, radio sets consisted of a piece of quartz and a cat's whisker which one had to f with which one had to find the active spot and could then, with a pair of earphones, listen to the voice of London calling. Now the media of radio and television can project the same programme into as many receiving sets as can be manufactured and sold. The result is that party politics and political personalities have become our daily entertainment. That egalitarian <laughs> democracy should have become the accepted norm of the social structure of the modern West 
and radically spreading to the rest of the world can be seen in, as the inevitable outcome of this technological revolu revolution. We are encouraged by tricks of technique to imagine that these personalities who enter our living rooms through the television screens are our personal acquaintances since they have access to our private rooms at all times. <coughs> as a rule, they choose to be known by abbreviated first names formerly used among friends. Plato, who held democracy in low regard, noted that people like it because it allows everyone to do what they like, but warns that it leads to tyranny. This is a danger we can see for ourselves in the concentration of power in the hands of whoever controls the press and the media. The likes of Rupert Murdoch and the late Robert Maxwell, able to control the minds of multitudes of people, not in a position to question whatever information true or false, the media disseminate. Thus, the authority of national institutions is imperceptibly undermined. Those who control the media can destroy political figures and institutions and communicate to the nation an attitude of cynical doubt about what is sneeringly described as the establishment. Monarchy is, of course, threatened by this universal democratization of public life. All values are eroded by the habit of mind that supposes that whatever a majority chooses must be right or can be decided by a general election. But values have their roots elsewhere than in majority decisions. Nevertheless, Monarchy is protected by the very fact that it is not a political office like that of an elected president or prime minister. Uh, Americans may sing God bless America, but this has no relevance to the American Constitution or the office of president as such, which is purely secular. Vocal sections of our press and media might like to see this country become a republic, but it would be hard to see what we would gain thereby, and all too easy to see what we would lose. What royalty does for the nation is to affirm that not man but God is supreme. This probably means nothing to great numbers of people who do not believe in God, but the existence of divinity does not believe in, in the, depend on the belief or disbelief of a majority or a general election. It is so or it is not so. And in this context, I would like to challenge the authority assumed by disbelief in the words of our, natural, uh, our national prophet, William Blake, did Jesus teach doubt, or did he give any lessons in philosophy, charge visionaries with deceiving, or call men wise for not believing? This country remains an officially Christian country, a fact that has deep roots in a reality still reflected in many aspects of our national life. The sacred is an order of things that belongs not to the world of technology and science, but to inner realities of the mind, immeasurable values and meanings on which human civilizations have been built from the beginning. It is for this reason that I find my support of monarchy as the best safeguard of human values. Just because the foundation of monarchy is not political, it safeguards those human freedoms and values which are the marks of true civilizations. Neither does the office depend on the personal faith of the monarch. Queen Victoria accepted her office with the famous words, I will be good. On the whole, no doubt she was, and we may be better for a monarch who is good and sets a good example to the rest of us. No doubt Queen Elizabeth II has done so, and in the face of great difficulties. But the royal office belongs to the national identity, not to the personality of the monarch. In the same way, in the administration of the law, the judge, 
when he dons the wig of off that signifies his office, is no longer a private person, but personifies the law in whose name he gives judgment. Since the restoration of the monarchy in the person of King Charles II, the performance of the ceremony of coronation by a priest of the Church of England in the person of the Archbishop of Canterbury confers on the anointed king or queen a spiritual authority as head of the Church of England. The reigning monarch is under the law and under God but the head of the Church of England, whose independence from Rome was established by Henry VIII at the time of the Reformation. L. L. Blake, the constitutional historian, has explained in detail the nature and implications of this constitutional fact, and he will be giving the second lecture in this series. Since most of the offices performed by both political and royal figures are purely secular in their nature, there, is, is, there are no doubt that the palace advisers engaged in projecting this secular and democratically acceptable image of royal, royalty. This is natural enough, but does, not, but does nevertheless lessen the respect in which royalty is held. The nature of that royal office is imprinted on the coin of the realm. The letters FD or FIDDEF stand for Fide Defensor, usually translated as Defender of the Faith, that is to say, of the Church of England. It is a pity that the nature and, and history of the cons our Constitution are scarcely taught at all in our schools, and it is a matter of general ignorance and indifference. Our Prince of Wales, in an important speech, has given wider meaning to the words, perfectly consistent with the Latin, ex in expressing his wish, if he becomes king, to be known not as defender of the faith, but as defender of faith. Thus, the royal title would include not only Catholics, nonconformists and Jews, but important communities, Muslims, Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, Buddhists, and other non-Christian communities, uh, and non-Christian uh, ethnic groups who now enjoy British citizenship, not to mention many people who belong to no religious community, but have in their hearts the love of, divi of the divine being. Not only must these words give enormous hope and protection, the prince's words are in themselves a powerful statement against racism. Thus, in our national life, the monarch is a shared symbol of a sacred authority above politics or personal power of whatever kind. What it does for the nation is to affirm that not man but God is supreme. How, however, welcome as are the prince's words, it is nevertheless remains true that England is officially a Christian country whose church is by law established. By that authority, certain offices of the state, notably the coronation of the monarch, are carried out. One would not wish to see these constitutional structures undermined. These are collective and national, not personal and private matters. However, the supreme power in our modern secular democracies is clearly money. No candidate for the American presidency can present himself unless some powerful person or organization puts up a very large sum of monies. This compromises the freedom of any elected president from the start. In England, this is not so, and any responsible candidate sponsored by his or her political party can stand as a candidate. The reason for this is, without question, the supremacy of the crown, the fact that we are all, constitutionally speaking, Her Majesty's subjects, and that the Queen presides over the opening of Parliament, protects the very precious freedom from subjugation by the all but supreme power of mammon. The Murdochs and the Maxwells may control the media, which is bad enough, but they do not control the crown. 
the election of our members of parliament is, rel is as relatively free from the control of money as it is, thanks to the monarchy, which sets a bound to the power of the Maxwells and the Murdochs. We are probably not as grateful as we should be, largely owing to the widespread ignorance as to how things work in our extremely complex constitutional monarchy or to what extent our individual freedoms uh, are guaranteed and underpinned by the constitution. Royalty is in its ultimate nature an archetype. Plato introduced this word, which has been given new actuality as a psychological fact by C.G. Jung in the 20th century. As such, it is not the prerogative of any individual, monarch or commoner, but a universal human attribute of which, monarch stands, of which the monarch stands as a unifying symbol in relation to a particular nation. So understood, kingship is manhood in its fullest development, and queenship, womanhood, in its fullest development, by no means the same thing as political feminism. Kingship and queenship are used as terms signifying such perfection, often in a purely poetic sense. One thinks of Shelley's Prince Athenaise, or in Republican France, Nerva's Prince d'Aquitaine, as a tour aboli. William Blake, no royalist, wrote of himself as, I, William Blake, a mental prince. Uh, kingship is a quality of being, and again, Blake defines this quality in a letter to his old friend George Cumberland, written shortly before his own death. Flaxman is gone, and we must all soon follow everyone to his own eternal house, leaving the delusive goddess nature and her laws to get into freedom from all law of the members into the mind in which everyone is king and priest in his own house. God send it so on earth as it is in heaven. In the Jewish tradition that every man is king and priest in his own household is acknowledged in the custom of the head of the household every Friday night, the Jewish holy day, dressing in his best clothes and receiving respectful homage from younger members of the family. In Spain, this custom was used to track down nominal Christian converts who were in reality still practicing the Jewish religion at the risk of life itself. Blake could conceivably have known of this country, highly as he himself regarded the Jews. Thus, kingship is in itself, is, that kingship is itself the highest attainment of humankind reached by few. But perhaps we all know or have known someone who possessed the qualities of kingship and thereby what Kant recognized in King Lear, authority. This concept of innate rank innate stature and rank is the basis of the caste system which has prevailed in India, grounded as it is in human nature. There are four main castes with many subdivisions, essentially related to social functions. The highest caste is that of the Brahmins, who are custodians of spiritual knowledge and learning which in India is always related to spiritual knowledge in some form. Brahmins may not work, may not seek wealth or power, and their authority is not political. The ruling caste, the Kshatriyas, have the duty to support the Brahmins. Thus, kings take second place in the order of things, a fact implicit in the coronation of our kings being confirmed by Christian priesthood. Farmers, craftsmen, merchants, and all the multitude of makers and doers, doers who have made India a land of beauty and abundance are the Vaishyans, while the fourth caste, the Shudras, are the workmen. All four castes are essential to the prosperity of society as a whole, and with ups and downs, the caste system has sustained India over many millennia as indeed the class structure has served England well. 
In the 20th century, we have seen the fourfold nature of humankind reaffirmed in the strongest possible psychological terms by C.G. Jung as the four types of men governed respectively by reason, feeling, sensation, and intuition. The four apocryphal beasts, eagle, lion, ox, and angel, or man, establish the quaternity at the very heart of Christendom. And there are comparable mythological quaternities in most known cultures, past or present. People fall naturally into one or another of Jung's types with, again, recognizable variations. Any human community, a colony, for example, will form itself naturally into this pattern. The Bhagavad Gita warns against the adoption of roles or tasks that are not proper to our natures, and we can see for ourselves that people are happiest when performing the work natural to them. Much of the unhappiness within our egalitarian democracies comes from our assumption that everyone should be everything at once, or so it can be argued. In this imperfect world, no system, no institution is perfect, but monarchy as an archetype seems to correspond to something in human nature which has served this country very well. It is not the material and measurable that makes a nation, but its ideas and values. The same is true for every individual life. And in the world of imagination, kings, queens, princes, and princesses have from time immemorial to the present day designated those timeless, unaging values. I began this paper by pointing out that monarchy is the unquestioned order, unquestioned order of fairyland of which we have all been inhabitants. That is to say, monarchy is a powerful and enduring archetype. In confirmation of this view, I would like to conclude by uh, speaking of the work, uh, work of imagination that has enchanted the late 20th century, J. B. J. Uh, H. R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. This imaginative narrative sweeps, uh, uh, swept Amer the campuses of America and England too when it first appeared in 1953 and has been given new popularity as a brilliant film in 2001. The author was a distinguished professor of linguistics in Oxford, member of the academic circle known as the Inklings, which included C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, other members of Oxford's elite. He was in religion a professed Catholic. As far as civilization has brought this, uh, brought uh, the Western world from primitive sources of traditional myth and folklore. The Lord of the Rings is a major work that has been compared to Spence's Fairy Queen, to Mallory, and by C.S. Lewis to Ariosto. It is, it is, an imaginary world unrivaled in its relevance to the actual human situation, cosmic, homely, epic, monstrous, or diabolic, C.S. Lewis's words. The third and final volume of this astonishing book is entitled The Return of the King, a figure whose anonymous presence throughout has come to represent honor, nobility, peace, and uh, banishing the power of evil and restoring justice, joy, and due order throughout the world. Not only does the king banish and, re and replace the rule of evil in the world, but the stewardship of rulers who have exercised their office justly on the whole, although the last holder of this office uh, uh, dies rather than relinquish his power. His son, however, willingly hands over and acknowledges the, the rightful king. Uh, 
The broken sword is mended, the dead tree lives again, and joy returns to the kingdom. Who does not feel at the end of Tolkien's three volumes that this is as it should be? To a generation bereft of any shared religious mythos, this spacious imaginative work offers a world both comprehensive and satisfying. In that world, the celestial hierarchies are represented by non-human races, and, and the, as are the Hells and their evil populace. Within that world, the hobbits, halflings, or little people may be entrusted with a task on whose fulfillment all the hierarchies depend. A reassuring message for a generation wondering what small creatures, uh, such small creatures as ourselves can do in a vast, mysterious universe. It must be remembered that kingship is attributed to Jesus Christ, Christ the King, son of the heavenly father who is king of kings and lord of lords the lord of the rings has indeed restored due order to the modern western imagination and the return of the king is more than a fictional fancy in a world starved of beauty and dignity seeking for meaning in times that have lost their significance it is a work of healing and in this archetypal masterpiece is, and its revolution in the return of the king, due order is indeed restored to the Mundus imagination. But you must be wondering why I have not mentioned the supreme archetype of monarchy in this country, which is, of course, King Arthur, and the once and future king, and, uh, and the archetype of kingship It has been celebrated by a modern writer greater than Tolkien, David Jones. And Tom Durham will conclude this paper by reading the last page of David Jones's uh, poem, The Sleeping Lord, which of course celebrates the supposed sleep of King Arthur awaiting the day when his return will be called for. In Northumberland, there is a legend that he has been found sleeping in a cave, uh, awaiting a res return by a, a shepherd who was working on the hills. And the story is current in many parts of England, where he is supposed to sleep in a cave, awaiting the time of his return. And many of us remember how in the Second World War, there was a strong feeling about King Arthur around that he was returning perhaps to this country in the form of Churchill, or in any case, in some sense, King Arthur is very strongly embedded in the national imagination of the English. And Tom Durham will read this splendid page from the David Jones's great work, The Sleeping Lord, which uh, many of you may already know. Yet he sleeps on. Very deep is his slumber. How long has he been the sleeping lord? Are the clammy ferns his rustling valance? Does the buried rowan ward him from evil? Or does he ward the tanglewood and the denizens of the wood? Are the stunted oaks his gnarled guard? Or are their gnarled limbs strong with his sap? Do the small black horses grass on the hunch of his shoulders? Are the hills his couch? Or is he the couchant hills? Are the slumbering valleys him in slumber? Are the still undulations the still limbs of him sleeping? Is the configuration of the land the furrowed body of the Lord? Are the scarred ridges his dented greaves? Do the trickling gullies yet drain his hog wounds? Does the land wait the sleeping Lord? 
or is the wasted land that very Lord who sleeps?